afternoon and welcome or welcome back to the Guyana Extractive Sector Transparency Week. My name is Kitty Sabasle. I'll be your host today and for the conference. You might have heard much from our speakers in previous sessions and on day one. I can assure you that what we have in store for you today is just as equally exciting. And the topic is extractives and open government. And we have two speakers here with us today, Mr. Frederick Collins, the president of Transparency Institute Guyana and the vice president, Mr. Alfred Bolai. We are just honored to have them both come online with us and provide us with some very interesting information about extractives and open government. And what they are going to tackle is the fact that only open government can provide the full supporting environment for the newborn environmental activism launched in Guyana and the Caribbean. And just for your information, Transparency Institute Guyana is a local affiliate of Transparency International. And where when they realized where things were headed with the newly found oil deposits, they undertook the legal aspects of contracts in the oil sector. And they've been publishing their findings since 2018. With that, I would like to give a warm welcome to Mr. Frederick Collins. Thank you so much, Kitty. And um, the pleasure is ours at TIGI, as we call it, Transparency Institute Guyana Inc., to do this presentation. I trust that the participants will find it uh, a valuable use of their time. So um, that's our title. And uh, this hole that you, you see here, this, this picture, comes on the website of one of the mining companies. And um, that's just a lovely picture to start our discussion with. Um, here you can see uh, one of our marches. And if you recognize no other face, you should recognize that gentleman you see in the middle there with the banner. I think everybody in the country knows him by now. He is one of our members and uh, one of the most um, well-known activists and commentators in terms of the contract and the oil industry. His name is Mr. Christopher Rahm. So what, let's begin by just noting what is uh, open government. And according to Wikipedia, it is the governing doctrine which sustains that citizens have the right, the right to access the documents and proceedings of the government to allow for effective public oversight. In its broadest construction, it opposes reason of state and other considerations which have tended to legitimize extensive state secrecy. So I want to ask any, I want to continue by asking if anyone knows, I gave you a preview, very quick quiz. What is a gigaton or a gigaton? I know we have two different um, pronunciations. And um, again, what is a gigaton? And I want to tell you that um, although I have been a math teacher for about 13 years of my life in a secondary school, um, I did not know, I know the word gigaton, I know what giga means, I think. I know what ton means. I know when you put them together what you're supposed to get. Um, but it was only recently that I got a, the full impact of what that could mean to the extractive industry in this country. Let me go to the next slide. So according to estimates, the, position, the potential is for the release of 3.87 gigatons of carbon. This is according to the case that Belinda Janke, our most well-known environmentalist, has filed. Wikipedia informs us that one gigaton is the equivalent of 1 billion metric tons or 2.2 trillion pounds, or get this, 10,000 fully loaded US aircraft carriers. So even if you didn't get 
any idea of the zeros before, I think you know what 10,000 means. And I think you can have a concept, even if you've never read it, of what a fully loaded US aircraft carrier <laughs> might weigh. And that is the amount of, that is our contention of how much carbon is going to be released by the operations outside in the ocean there, by the oil exploration. Now, the point we're making, here's the point, is that information to the Guyanese people is critical. But more than the information is the ability to understand the implications. That is why we need open government, citizen engagement. So we need information and we need the people to be able to interact with that information or else it's meaningless to them. So open government includes all of that. So there's our aircraft carrier there, not intend to bill any, but uh, so you can be reminded how, 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 what's the amount of carbon we are going to be, 10,000 of those fully loaded. loaded. And we're going to be claiming as you were um, told just now that open, only open government can provide the full supporting environment for the newborn environmental activism launched in Guyana and the Caribbean by the case that has been uh, filed. So let's go now, to what's our take, meaning Tiggy's take, transparency's take on extractives in Guyana. The signs are that the operations are heavily influenced by illegality. We're not only talking about the oil companies, the entire extractive industry. This applies to locally owned operations as well as foreign owned. Over the last 10 years or so, it has become apparent that what was a tendency has become a simmering culture. For example, about around 2013, I think it was. Um, I'm getting so old these days, I don't even know which year it was, but it's sometime around then, eight years ago. There was a shipment of gold that was seized by the authorities, gold bars by the Curacao authorities. And uh, shortly after, some men in the night managed to seize it back from them and let it sail to where it was going. And there were some strange happenings attendant, if that was a strange enough. Apparently, the men were police uniforms in English with the word police written in English instead of P-O-L-I-S as it is written in Papiamento. But some strange things happened there. It's all recorded in our newspapers. And then we had the Thomas Carroll affair. And that was uh, an affair in which uh, an official of a certain embassy, that shall be nameless, that um, used, uh, uh, he had his little thing going and he collected a lot of gold bars and the officials of that embassy had to come and do their own investigation. The proceeds are recorded in a very entertaining book in Guyana. Um, and this is one that is not generally known, but it has come to Tiggy's attention that a certain company, again, which shall be nameless, um, this company that used to operate in Guyana, it shall be nameless because we have, the, we have this little vibe that it is going to be playing something in our future again. But we were made to understand that that company was actually flying out gold bars directly from the interior into the United States of America. You know, we have our sources of information. And um, when this gets to them, they might be surprised that we know. But yes, that information has come to us. And of course, we have the contract that has everybody's attention, the Exxon contract, in which we will be talking about the illegality that we wrote about. So it's the Exxon contract that secrecy and deception to facilitate law breaking appear to have reached a new dangerous level in which politicians appear to have facilitated the plunder of the nation's resources for the benefit of a few. For example, out of the mouth of ministers of government have issued what were subsequently proven to be demonstrable lies. For example, one minister said that uh, the government was going to use the services of a certain international financial agency and a certain regional organization to get the government to draft the contract. He said that in 2017. When the contract came out, it was dated 2016. So obviously, 
uh, there is what some people call a terminological inexactitude somewhere, which is a long name for a lie. So that is one of the features that we have noticed in this contract. Now, uh, so there's a culture of law breaking, we believe that has been unleashed. We believe that the development since 2019, when we launched our series of articles, analyzing the clauses of the Exxon contract, indicate that if there was any doubt before, the words of Exxon cannot be trusted. I don't think that we are saying anything new. The papers were treated to a ruling in the United States in which um, um, the judge, I think, ruled and said as much. So um, I don't think we're saying anything new there. And even if there could be the culture of law breaking that has been fostered to facilitate that contract has steeped the country into a free for all of contempt for the law. When an international financial institution, again, which shall be nameless, but is there in the papers, can accept without bid a contract for rewriting a country's laws for an amount which clearly is outside the limit that requires public tender, the irony is inescapable. This agency undertakes, accepts without a bid to, uh, 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 to take on a contract, takes on a contract for rewriting the country's laws for an amount that, bid, that, that, that uh, uh, estimate is clearly outside of the limit that requires public tender according to the tender laws. Now, clearly we have some irony there. I don't think that, I think there were some serious objections made and I don't think that went ahead. Now, um, some illegalities of the contract. So what are these illegalities? Number one, we believe that the Exxon contract is a catalog of flouted or outright broken laws. Secondly, they are, they are breaches of the law in spirit, at least at the very least, they are breaches of the law in spirit. They are breaches of the, of the letter of the law. We believe so as well. And we believe that they are breaches of international practice. Oh, they are clear breaches of international. That's not a matter of belief. That's easily demonstrable as we shall show. There is one breach that is at least a breach in spirit and of international practice, if not the letter. We call it the original sin. And it is so glaring and obvious that any silence on this must have been part of the quasi conspiracy that Melinda Janke spoke about in one of our conferences. This will be clear to anyone who could read English. Now, if I can coax this screen to go next, it normally takes a, a bit of coaxing. Ah, so let's take a look at some of the gross illegalities, what it means. Here you will see the largest area awarded on a single license. Note the word single license, okay? So Kenya before 2006, you will see the square kilometers, 800 square kilometers. And let's see what that means. In terms of the area of Georgetown, that is 12 times the area of Georgetown, which is 70 square kilometers. Kenya after, it was reduced to half. That is what they will give you on a, a company on a single license. That's six times the area of Georgetown. Brazil, which are according to the 2018 license runs, 1,215 square kilometers. That's 17 times the area of Georgetown. Trinidad, 1,720, 25, 24 times the area of Georgetown. Suriname, according to the, um, to its, its, its it, it's plans when we did this uh, chart that was about, uh, I think, uh, two years ago. Uh, the average per block would have been 1,690 square kilometers. We don't know what it turned out to be, but um, this is when they were planning their license rounds. This is 23.5 times the area of Georgetown. Guyana, the legal amount allowed is 5,073 square kilometers. You can see that Guyana is ample. It's four times Brazil, three times Trinidad. That is the entire island. I, when I say three times Trinidad, three times Trinidad is a low uh, uh, average uh, area on a single license. 
But in terms of the size of the country, it's the entire island of Trinidad, which is 5,131 square kilometers. So let's take a look now and see what was actually given on that single license to uh, ESO. Come on now. Yes, look at the bottom there. And you will see in green, the comparison, 26,800 square kilometers or five times the island of Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad, sorry, or 382 times Georgetown. Now, in order to do that, when the law only allowed for a maximum, a maximum of 5,073, you can appreciate that there had to be a, a lot of stretching. You had to have put the clauses of that contract on a bed of procrustes, stretch where it, um, make sure that he, he couldn't fit you, stretch and perhaps cut where you, 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 if he was too tall. And so let me stop a minute and ask if there are any questions so far before I go on to this, because we, we will talk a little bit more about that, but we are going to take a break and talk about some constitutional provisions. So any questions at this point? Yeah, let's take a look. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. It's It has sparked quite a conversation. Well, your first question to the audience about gigatons, it sparked two questions. So here is the first one. According to data, 51 gigatons are released into the atmosphere per year. If 3.87 gigatons are going to be released over 20 to 30 years, thus that is 3.87 divided by 1,020, isn't that a very small percentage? Well, I would not pretend, I would not pretend to be able to answer that question effectively because I must tell you that one thing I did not represent myself, one thing Tiki did not represent me is, is an environmentalist. And I will, you will see at the end that our position is not, we are not attempting to stop the contract. We have a different position, but I wanted to get that over to you so that even if that question is asked by our population, even if that is their response, they must ask the question in the first place, what is the amount that is being released? And even if that is the answer that it is not too much, they must be able to respond with that um, answer because they have become familiar with it. I have my uh, partner here who is a better environmentalist than I am. I don't know if Alfred wants to make any comment. No, no, I, I have um, I have no comment. Uh, I, I would not have um, included the thing about gigatons. Um, well, what it is, is it is really the amount of warming such, um, such quantities are supposed to produce. That is really um, what we should be looking at. But th that well, is all I would say. Well, if there is any misunderstanding, I would have to ask, we will see it in court because those are what the, according to the, I think it was the New York Times reported from the court papers, that that is what is the claim that the uh, operations will release that amount of um, uh, carbon. Now, interestingly enough, while the question is asked, is, a, is, is it seems to be a valid one and seems to make almost a nonsense of the amount, uh, going with that is what we were told as the um, operations were being discussed and um, the amount of switch was identified as 4,000 4, uh, barrels of sewage going to be discharged in the ocean. Again, I guess somebody can make um, a, 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 an analysis and say that 4,000 barrels of sewage every day is not going to be much. Again, I don't know the answer to that question. Again, I'm saying I'm not an environmentalist, but it is the information that we need to be out there that sparks the very discussion and the very apparent refutation that somebody implies by the question that we in Guyana need to have 
so that in the first place there is a claim and there must be a refutation and it must say well that does not matter and there must be a healthy discussion i see my uh, partner raising his finger go on, on. yes um no it is a small percentage but there is a proviso there is a, a caveat you see exxon does not tell us how much of that is vented gas while producing gas is vented um, gas is flared and vented now the vented gas is methane mostly as at least 28 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So that, um, that figure of 3.87 gigatons of carbon dioxide uh, cannot be accurate because nobody knows how much is being vented and how much is being flared. If you flare it and burn it, it turns to carbon dioxide which is what is measured there. But if it isn't burnt, methane comes off, which has over 100 years, 28 times the global warming potential, and in the short term, 84 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So ultimately, we don't know. And that is one of the issues we have with Exxon. Thank you so much. And this is a related question. You might have answered this. I just want to make sure that we get to all questions. Is that 3.87 gigaton direct emission or scope three? It doesn't matter to us. I do not know the answer. As I have said to you, I am quoting the figure in the uh, legal case. And our claim is that open government means information. And there must be an engagement of the citizenry with these figures. And whether it is, whatever is the answer to your question, unfortunately, uh, this, part, this speaker can only quote the figures for what they are worth in the case that he's making. If you ask me to go deeper into it, as I admitted to you, I did not even know what was a gigaton too much at the beginning. So I don't know if Alfred wants to make any comment here. Well, except you, you are right. We do not know, and it is not our figure. It is the figure in the cited in the court case. Very good. Thank you for the clarification. Now, here's the next question. Mr. Collins, the media and groups such as the Oil and Gas Governance has written that the government of Guyana is not releasing and sharing data, reports, and production data regarding oil and gas and studies relating to the gas to shore pipeline. How would you comment and what grade will you give the Guyana government on open government? Sorry, what was that? How would I comment on what? How would you comment, comment and what grade will you give to the Guyana <laughs> government on open government? Well, as you will see from what we are about to present later on, I would probably give the government a zero because we as an organization have been asking the government for information ourselves and uh, um, the information has not been forthcoming in fact the kind of um, non-response we get suggests that we're being a nuisance more than anything else and um, we our colleagues in civil society have also we have transmitted their their their, their queries for uh, information in terms of the basis of some of the um, environmental impact studies. And we have not gotten, the, for example, in terms of the very gas pipeline, I think you mentioned, and we have not gotten that information. Alfred, can you expand on that, please? Is that, is that true? Yes, we have, we have um, gone through the normal channels. We have written the Guyana government more specifically, the Ministry of Natural Resources on these matters. We've sent a table for them to fill up with the, here are these platforms, the, the floating, production, um, storage and offloading. 
production, right? We don't know how much is produced. All we, have, we, we can only take what Exxon says. Storage, we don't know how much is stored. Uh, we don't know how much is offloaded. We only, the, all we know is that what they tell us. Now, in addition to that, um, we, a compressor went bad. Now, this compressor was taking so long to be fixed. But the compressor has to deal with pressures to send the stuff back, to re-inject the stuff down, and to cope with it. They are not telling us. We asked, but they don't tell us what the pressures are. In March, we asked them. Uh, a month and a half later, they still didn't say anything. We wrote, the, we wrote what we asked in the newspapers. And up to now, we still haven't got any answers. Recently, the, for the Yellowtail project, the Environmental Protection Agency has promised, because I was so persistent, they promised to get back to us. They haven't gotten back yet. Uh, so I would give the government a failing grade. Uh, there is another question that um, Dr. Jailal has um, written. Says, Does TG have a formal agreement with the Guyana government relating to monitoring and accountability of the extracted sector? The answer is no. They don't want to hear about TG. They try to treat TG as if it doesn't exist. It's not, a, uh, it's not mentioned in the papers except perhaps if they want some favorable comment on some aspect that will make them look good. Otherwise, they don't know TG. All right. Um, I, it's a good thing I have my, my um, henchman, sorry, my partner there to back me up. But um, I want to say that I don't necessarily agree with um, Alfred. I want to give the, give the government one tiny mark because at the beginning, when the government took power, in terms of the local content policy, we were invited. They asked us our opinion in a survey, and we were fast on the draw. I think I made sure I drew it to their attention that we were the first to submit the answer to the survey. And then um, we were part of the meeting. So this seemed to us to have boded well for a future relationship. But things soon reached the kind of relationship that we're talking about, non relationship, which uh, Alfred is talking about. Yes, so uh, back to the questions, if any more. Yes, thank you so much for clarifying. And the, the debate is welcome. This is the forum for posing opinions and questions. So here is the next one Is TG part of the MSG? If not, why? If yes, what actions have been taken as part of MSG to correct the laws broken? And MSG is the multi-stakeholder group. Well, um, Alfred, you want to make a comment here? Do I say well, We have members of, um, of TG in, uh, in the multi-stakeholder group. And I think um, one of them has present, is presenting. Um, what, go on, and, sorry. And uh, now, I um, was in it at the very beginning. There were, there were three parts. There's the, the civil society, there's the government, and there's the extractive industry. Those um, three groups of multi-stakeholder. Now, as a businessman, I was in the industrial group. I have a service business, energy services. But I, it, quick, it conflicted with my civil society work, so I recused myself, and uh, I'm just doing civil society work now. But we do have people in the um, multi-stakeholder group who are members of Transparency Institute, and who okay. we consult when we do these things. Okay, at this point, I just want to interject. I just want to uh, make a few things clear. Uh, neither 
Alfred nor I ever thought that we would be in the position that we are to be representing an anti-corruption uh, uh, body. Well, I, I can speak for myself, of course. And I'm saying that to say that when you ask if we have an agreement with so-and-so, uh, we are, uh, we have been under-resourced for a very long time. It was only last year that we were able to receive some significant funding and that for a specific project. And uh, I'm saying that to say that none of us, nine of the two of us or anyone else on the uh, uh, TIGI board, although we have a voluntary, the, per the, the person who is closest to environmental work is uh, a university lecturer who is a member and uh, he deals with, the, with anything to do with EU FLECT matters. Um, we are only gathering volunteers in order to do the kind of work and both, all the directors work free. Make sure you understand that. I work free, Alfred works free. We are now trying to put together the kind of effort and adv for advocacy and education that Guyana strongly needs. And we happen to find ourselves and we intend to do the best we can. So please do not uh, expect that we are going to be able, or I at least am going to be able to tell you what I don't know about environmentalism. Even the word is a little strong for me to uh, uh, pronounce, and I'm a man of words as a Scrabble player. So please understand that we are in these seats voluntarily. Nonetheless, please ask your questions and don't pull your punches. If you cannot answer, we cannot answer. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Collins. Now we have a few more questions. Is it okay if we take a few before we move on to the next part of your presentation? Or shall we move on with the Please presentation? Do. Please and, do. All right. Then here we go. This is the next, next one. For all the illegalities for Starbora contract, what is being done by TG to rectify these issues? What are EITI guidance with respect to a country law laws being broken for oil production? Well, let me answer the second part first. Um, the EITI has made it clear to us that they expect TIGI to follow up on their findings. We are now putting together, we have been attempting to assemble the kind of staff that we need to be able to do that kind of work. Our directors are overburdened and we are seeing some light at the end of the tunnel in order to get staff. But yes, um, the answer to your, the second part of the question is that, uh, we have been, um, the, the information has been shared and we have been, it's been made clear to us by the EITI that they expect TIGI to follow up on such disclosures are being, that are being made and we intend to do that. And what was the first part again of the question? The first part was about, uh, let me go back to that question very quickly. For, the, for all the illegalities for Starbra contract, what is being done by TIGI to rectify these issues? Okay, well, um, what is being done to rectify those issues? What a question. <laughs> if you read the newspapers, you will see that the press, uh, especially Kaichur News, if it's given them credit, uh, makes a point of every day drawing to our attention the need for the population to respond uh, with a little bit more vigilance. Um, in terms of TIGI, so I'm saying that to say that it is not for want of identifying the problem. We at TIGI believe that we made a great contribution in our series of articles. And in those articles, we have had people make comments to us. We have never had a a serious refutation of any of the points that we exposed. Um, maybe they're waiting now to make them, I don't know, but we have not had a serious refutation. Uh, and so I'm saying that to say that that series of articles took a lot of research, a lot of work. And so identifying what we consider to be the weak points of that contract, I think 
Uh, it's a great start for us if we have to say so ourselves, it nearly killed us in the process. But having done so, we are going to, we are, we are going to as, we, as we go along, you will see we have some uh, other comments that might point the way um, to what perhaps can be done. In fact, we do have some uh, proposals uh, uh, for what we, we, we think should happen. So maybe should, we should hold on until those points come along in the presentation. Perfect, let's do that. Now, here is the next question. What is your organization's PR strategy for providing this useful information to the public on a regular basis? Good, that's very easy. We are about to launch uh, what we call our open government. Well, we, we, that's the title of our presentation, open government and extractives. We are about to launch our call for open government. And that call will be to the entire population. We intend to let both political parties know. We have already hinted that. Uh, we've made that, we've disclosed that publicly. We are going to write them formally and say what we are demanding. We, 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 our posture is not one where we're going to be pleading with anybody. We are demanding because it is the right of the public to know as this little thing that uh, is on the screen we, will, we are going to talk about just now gives us the right to do. And uh, we are going to be trying to include every single organization, whether it's the church, whether it is ethnic organization, whether it is ACLA, whether it is the Indian rights organization, the Amerindian, we are going to be appealing to the entire country to get behind their, what is required in the, in the, as a duty for all citizens. And that's our program. Hopefully, it's, it was supposed to be launched before, but we've been having some setbacks. Hopefully, we should get going by the 1st of July. And you should be, you won't ask me that question because you will by then see in the uh, press in the newspapers and on some billboards what we're talking about very good we are looking forward to that now let's take one more question before we go on we have plenty more questions but let's just take one last one before we move on and i'm sure some of the presentation later on might actually answer some of the questions in the queue so here we go what can the guyanese public do to bring the single license into legal compliance with guyana's law ah uh. Hold that question for a little more, uh, a little later in the presentation. Please make a note of it in case we skip it, but I don't think you can because we have it in the presentation. So I should continue. Then let's continue with the presentation. Wonderful. So constitutional provisions. I touched just now on the right of the citizen. And I have taken a, an extract out of the uh, complaint that has been made by the citizens of Houston uh, with regard to constitutional provisions. And uh, I, 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 I took it without uh, copyright uh, permission, but I'm sure they'll forgive me for it. Uh, in Article 146, one of the constitution provides a binding legal framework for access to information. With respect to public participation, the constitution states that the principal objective of the political system of the state is to establish an inclusionary democracy by providing increasing opportunities for the participation of citizens and their organizations in the management and decision-making processes of the state, with particular emphasis on those areas of decision-making that directly affect their well-being. And so, there, the, 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 the constitution, as it says, provi provides a binding legal framework. The constitution, therefore, um, in case I miss it, but it's there somewhere in the presentation, when one essential part of this whole open government business is access to information. That's a fundamental plank of the thing. And um, we have an act that masquerades as a, an Access to Information Act. In Tigi, we call it the Freedom to Withhold Information Act. It does not serve its purpose. But this, what, as we examine this constitution, the more we examine the constitution, the more we realize that it doesn't matter whether the act is fit for purpose or not. It is merely a vehicle that gives expression to what the constitution provides. And if the vehicle is not fit, then we are going to resort 
to the provisions in the constitution to demand the information that we want. And so that is what we, we, we want to point out at this stage, that, 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 that these efforts to hide behind some kind of a flimsy access to information act, they ain't gonna work because we as citizens are going to be going to the root of whatever is provided in our constitution in order to demand certain things. Um, now, I mentioned to you just now, I stole some, that section from this uh, complaint. And uh, it is from this um, complaint by the appeal by the citizens against the decision by the EPA not to require an environmental impact assessment for a facility at Houston. And it makes a case for open government all by itself. Without citizen vigilance, the decision would have gone unnoticed. Without citizen vigilance, a facility involving nuclear waste would have quietly been installed without the knowledge of the residents. And even after an environmental impact assessment, citizens must still be able to monitor whatever conditions are permitted. Nature and quantities of stored and processed substances, radiation meters, air quality meters, water quality meters, etc. Now, uh, one of the um, the things, by the way, um, that last section there, um, I said I was not an environmentalist and I still maintain that. And that has been uh, put in by my uh, partner there, uh, who is, ba is, is backing me up, who knows more about these things than I do. We work as a team. And the, this issue of nuclear waste. Now, somebody might ask the question and give me some statistic and tell me, oh, but Mr. Collins, it is only going to be 0 0.000, maybe a nano, nano something of a nuclear uh, of, of, of radiation that is going to be released. Why do you make such a fuss? And that is the point. We don't know. We need to know. This is not the United States that is accustomed to dealing at that level with anything that has the word nuclear in it. They would have certain things built into your systems, their systems that would detect certain things. This is a, almost a donkey cart society. You're going to be bringing nuclear stuff near to people's homes. And this is the point you're making. When it's small, great, we need to know. The citizens must know what is happening to them. In the case of your, your the United States, uh, the famous movie, I think it's what is Erin 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 Brockovich. Sorry if I don't um, remember exactly the name. You know about that one woman campaign and how much how much trouble she had until she actually was able to reveal what was happening. People getting sick and that. We, we don't want to. We don't need to. We don't need to repeat history. Uh, now. It's not only foreign companies. We know that the EITI process has flushed out happenings in the interior of Guyana, which clearly show that there is a free for all. The free for all we see with foreign mining companies has its mirror image in the local scene as well. We are learning of strange happenings with regard to mining concessions. Again, it is only because of the advent of the EITI that the rest of the country is learning what regulations are being broken with the likely full knowledge of official down. This tells us that we need information on all government operations to be made public securely and on a continuous daily basis. So we go back now to the contract. Um, this famous contract, you notice it's in inverted commas. Tiggy's position, and we want to make it clear at this point, Tiggy's position is different from our colleagues in the environmental movement. How so? We do not yet, we do not yet accept that it is better that the oil be left under the seabed. We believe that the so-called contract, which is a catalog of illegalities, could only be regularized, not renegotiated. So you can see, please capture the screen if you want to know, um, you want to get a, a copy of those articles and analysis, analyses which we did, the 2018 one and the 2019 series, you'll begin to see some of the um, analysis we did there. So since it is illegal, there's only one thing that could be done with it. Somebody asked that question, and I trust that as we I proceed, the question you asked, what could be done? It might we might be able to form something. 
yes, there's only one thing that could be done, that is to bring it in line with Guyana law. Now, I'm a forgive me if I, if I jump from topic to topic, but um, I said we will expand on that as I go on. But open government, we'll go to open government at this point. The problem with our country is that there is too much space occupied by politicians and politics. Everything is seen through a political lens. And perhaps this has come out of our economic and political history where the state employed about 80% of people in the 90s and uh, we did not really have a vibrant uh, private sector. Um, so open government will require civil society to obtain a seat at the table where all public matters are decided. This is not a call for the mere disclosure of information, but an activation of all the rights and duties envisioned in the Guyana constitution, which I gave you a slide a uh, short while ago. And we intend to go to the courts as necessary to push for legislation to build into the existing structures such items as a public monitor and a public defender so that citizens do not have to find their own funds to challenge constitutional breaches. Citizens need to wake up. He believes that since the politicians having clearly demonstrated that they have a different agenda from that which will benefit the majority of Guyanese, it is up to civil society to wake up to the implications which are that there is no one left but them in collaboration with whatever international allies can be formed. To that end, we are launching the call for open government. We are noting on passant, as it were, that uh, we have a, a, a serious problem. There are no real, there are few, if any, independent regulatory authorities. The question that this Schlumberger, if I got the pronunciation right, facility raises, like no other, is whether Guyana can afford to proceed with the present culture of lack of real independence of regulatory bodies. We know that great effort is spent on ensuring that heads of several agencies are politically aligned. In the past, there have been reports of influence on even the heads of arbitration tribunals. It is unlikely that an independent self-respecting regulatory authority would have made a decision to proceed without an EIA for that project at Houston. And that is part of the huge problem that we face. The, the, the bodies that are supposed to be autonomous and independent are subject to instructions from the center. We want to touch briefly on, and I will open for questions after this, because I'm sure this is going to generate a lot of uh, questions. The National Oil Company. Now, we find, we at Tiggy find it uh, quite puzzling that after five years, there has not been formed, there's still an argument about whether we need a national oil, oil, oil company. The, the establishment of a national oil company should have been the first order of business. It is in such a, a company that the technical skills to provide the kind of information to government for decision making should reside. It is unlikely that with an NOC, which is required to partner in any venture that the country would have had to rely on over, over. It is unlikely that we would have had to rely on pilots flying over to notice that flaring was taking place by Exxon. And with nothing to notice, venting of CH4 of much greater global warming potential. In other words, we don't know, we have nothing to monitor. We have to take what somebody tells us. But a national health company would have gone a long way in providing independent information because everything that the oil companies do, they have to have a partner with them, with people who know what they're talking about. We don't have any such thing. And it is really amazing that after so long, there's still an even debate about whether we have one. You can see one, our, our neighbor to the, uh, to the east, you can see one in Trinidad, our neighbor to the south, Brazil. Is it, is it that the, 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 Mexico, it's, is it that these people uh, are, are, are doing the wrong thing? It, it is truly amazing. Uh, the recent 
annual general meeting of Petrobras demonstrates how a strong governance system for a, a national company forces political designs into the open with likely consequences at the ballot box for wrong decisions. In other words, if we are talking about open government, then we must have strong supporting systems. We must have a, a, a strong ecology. And so um, in the case of Petrobras, I know somebody is going to tell me about all the uh, 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 corruption in, in Lava Jato and so on. But the only reason why there was corruption there is because there was money to be corrupt about in the first place. But um, it, there was the uh, annual general meeting and there was a battle so that Mr. Bolsonaro can get his man to uh, be part of the board, if not the, uh, uh, take the helm, whatever it was. But the entire country was paying attention. There were debates in the press. And so everything is on the public glare. And we need to reach that point where our affairs are being discussed intelligently. We might disagree, and we certainly will. Uh, but we cannot have a situation where the majority of the country relies upon um, central government and there is no real um, pressure. There is no independence of uh, information so that we are sure that our regulators know what they're talking about and they are, not, they are free from influence, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to stop there for a while. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. And yes, it did generate quite many questions. So let's pick up where we have left off. So we table this question here and let's see if uh, your presentation has fully answered or if you'd like to add anything to it. So here we go. What can the Guyanese public do to bring the single license into legal compliance with Guyana law? All right, well, since that question is, um, is, is asked twice and we, have, we don't seem to have uh, made it, uh, oops, as yet. And so what I will say to you is this, the contract um, needs to be, uh, I said, regularized, how so? Um, the, the blocks that were given together, that were, we call it wholesaling, the law only provided for 60 blocks. And that would have given you a total of 5,073, I think it was, we had in that table there, square kilometers, quite an ample amount. And instead, about five times as much were put together. I call it, we call it wholesaling. What can be done? We believe that it is possible for that to be undone by a court. In what way? The disadvantage in one huge swatch instead of the limit of 5073 means that you're finding oil in 5073 ties up under the control of the oil company, ties up the difference between 5073 and 26,800. Get that. So that is most likely why the model on which our laws were based. Because if you look at the law, the, the, the 1986 Petroleum Act, you would see it fits a template that was a, available at that time and still subsists to this day. And no doubt it was that very consideration, how much of the seabed would you allow one company to control at a time? So when you stitch together a, a, an entire uh, super block of 26,800, what you are doing instead of that discovery tying up only 5,073, you are tying up under the control of that one company, the entire 26,800 square kilometers. And that seemed to have escaped a lot of people. Now, what can be done? We're saying that the court should at the very least attempt to undo uh, the, 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 the jigsaw puzzle has been made 
and all of those pieces put together, the court should attempt to undo them and put them according to law so that you have perhaps about five or six blocks each separate. Now, how are we gonna do that is for that, 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 we didn't create the mischief, but we know it is quite possible for that to happen. And so that if you have five different blocks, then each of those blocks will have its own future with its own relinquishment clause, et cetera, et cetera, rather than what we have now, the entire 26,800 tied up under a very, apparently a very malleable agreement because uh, we are watching to see, we understand that the relinquishment clause was extended <laughs> to, to, to favor the oil companies, we don't know why, to 2022. That is uh, the information that we have. But you can see what we mean. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a very pli pliant kind of arrangement so that the law is whatever a politician and Exxon make it. We are saying that, again, to focus on the, 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 the answer to the question, again, we believe that that is one thing that one place we can start from, the original sin, the root problem. Yes, let me stop here. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. Now, the next question is short. If the contract is illegal, as you claim, why has Tiggy not gone to the court? <laughs> That's very easy. <laughs> very, very easy. As I said, we were under-resourced and we still are. And we are, in our, in our project that we're about to launch, we expect to uh, have the kind of response from the citizenry that brings more members, people who are more sensitized to the need to act on their own behalf and act along with us. And perhaps as our, uh, uh, our ex-president has demonstrated, uh, Dr. Troy Thomas, uh, where he and uh, his uh, competent legal help took the EPA to court and one uh, that, you know, we can perhaps do the same. And when I say we, I mean the citizens of the country, perhaps through us, but we are preparing. We are, we are now uh, putting things in order so that the citizens can be more engaged. That's the answer to the question. And here Wonderful. comes the next question. And it's somewhat related. You might have actually answered this question. Is Tiggy prepared to file lawsuits to force the government to release information since the trickle down of information is so slow? Absolutely. As I said before, the posture we are taking is that we're not pleading to anybody, any, we're not pleading to anybody for anything. We are going to demand according to what the constitution provides. And we certainly are prepared to go to court. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, the next question is, how has Tiggy engaged the younger generation to educate them on all the issues mentioned in this talk? That it has Tiggy engaged high schools, university students? Uh, let me answer that question by saying that we have, and this is where I go back to where um, my colleague Alfred Bulai was talking about support from government and they would rather not deal with us. He is referring perhaps to the earlier, um, the earlier edition of the current government in the 2030s and 2040s. We have never had permission to go into the schools. We would have loved to, uh, but um, we haven't tried yet. We are focusing on other things. But let me again speak of the youth. And I will tell you that the project that we have, um, the specific project that we have engaged in is a project that came out of engagement with youth. There were two um, open space activities that we did with our partner organization called Policy Forum Guyana. And out of those open space activities came the suggestion that and, and most of the attendees were young people in 2018 or 17, I can't remember which, probably 2018, that they needed to see where the oil proceeds were going and how the oil proceeds were going to be spent from a social equity standpoint. And that is what gave rise 
to the uh, project which we are pursuing. The project, that specific project is going to be, uh, the, so, so this open government call is a forerunner to that project. So that's the answer to the question. Our young people mostly are the ones who gave birth to this project that we are busy uh, pursuing at the moment. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. Now, here is the next question. I know you've been battling with allergies, so it is just really great that you are still here with us and you are taking all these fascinating questions. And I see in the chat, there is feedback coming back from the participant that they really appreciate this wonderful dialogue that your presentation has generated. So just kudos to our presenters. So I'm glad. <laughs> here is the next question. Fred, is regularized versus renegotiation just a semantic difference or are they qualitatively different processes? This person That's would a, like that, your view. That is such that is such a lovely question. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we've asked ourselves uh, the same question. And we believe that there's a material difference. And the, the, the difference lies in our concept of, in the first place, when you say renegotiate a contract, to us that connotates that the contract itself is legal, that, 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 that it is legal and it has, um, you know, it, 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 is, it is a full, a fully, uh, uh, it has its full existence grounded in law. When you examine as we have done, let me just, let me just point out one quick thing. Um, we, in one of our articles, pointed out that the effective date, just imagine, the effective date of the contract could be subject of a dispute. This, the, the, the effective date is an anchor concept in any contract. You don't have to look too far and to find out what is the effective date. In that contract, you have a reference to another reference that takes you back to that one. The only thing that is certain is that it is subject to dispute to establish what is the effective date of the contract. And that we found is typical of that, uh, that document. So we could not call that thing a contract. So we, when we say renegotiate, that assumes that that document is legal. Secondly, what we have discovered is that organizations like the OECD say that any contract, any, any, any arrangement like that, that uh, uh, establishes agreement between a, 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 an oil company or any company and, and, and a nation and, and the country must be subject, first of all, to the nation's laws. We see the contract claiming to be subject to law. We hear officials talking about how they obey the laws. But when you look at the contract, you see that it is. It seems to impose its own laws on what is the legal framework here. And so the answer to the question that you ask is that we believe that renegotiation, the word renegotiation should apply if you had a proper contract. What we have is a document that does not conform to the laws of this country in basic ways. Not only we said that, Christopher Lang, in his analysis, said as much before we began to uh, analyze. And so, um, again, finally, as you have raised the question, in terms of how the contract came into existence, we have a, 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 a fundamental problem because we believe that exploration, petroleum exploration, should be subject to the uh, uh, the Alfred. I'm running out of of, of, of vocabulary. The, the, what is the procurement? The, the the procurement laws of the country. There's a procurement act, which is um, uh, 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 gives gives expression, which um to to, 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 to the provisions in the constitution. And not only are we sure that 
petroleum exploration ought to have been the subject of, of a, a public tender. But we know as well that there are international organizations operating in Guyana that have sought legal advice and have received the same thing, the same advice that petroleum exploration ought to have been uh, are subject to public tender. But since then, furthermore, we have discovered that before this contract, before 1999-2000, uh, petroleum exploration was subject to public tender. And therefore, the constitution in 2000 could not have been intended to put us back uh, 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 worse than where we were before. So we are sure that this, this, this thing that is called a contract was born out of a, a, a decision to circumvent the laws of the country in every which, every which way you look. And so the answer to the question, as uh, uh, in terms of, the, of uh, what we mean by renegotiation versus we have to bring this monster, this, 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 this uh, hydra, this monster into somehow bring it along into the law with the laws, put it in line with the laws, such as could still be done because we can see every effort was being made because our position has been made public for, for years now. We can see that every effort has been made to put so many obstacles in the path of any attempt to salvage this thing, to bring it under, uh, to tame it under the laws of Guyana. But we don't, we don't uh, believe that uh, the, the, we don't believe that we have ex, ex, exhausted all the uh, potential. We are, we are humble enough to know that the court can do much better if we can, can, can even conceptualize it, the court can do even better. And so uh, it is not a matter of semantics. It is for us uh, a serious matter because this lawlessness, which affects not only what, what we saw in the Exxon so-called contract is an exploitation of a habit within the country, this habit of law breaking, where it seems as though there is a, 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 a quarter of wise men who decide which laws can be broken and why. This, this, this culture of law breaking was seen as what, what happened in, 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 in Malbray II. Uh, well, Margaret Lute, as we say it in, in, in uh, Malgré II was for your benefit, so you can know that I know some French. But um, Malgré II on the West Bank of, of Demerara, as, uh, as Indira uh, Idrania and Yolal wrote in a beautiful um, article, Malgré II means in French, in spite of everything. In spite of everything, they cut those mangroves down. The lawlessness that persists in this country, the whole, the, the whole, the, the excellent contract is, is part of this, this, this culture that has developed and continues to, 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 to uh, affect, uh, affect the country. And they will, it will descend further if the citizens do not wake up and arrest it. So the answer to the question, I'm sorry, I, 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 I've, I've been so expansive, but uh, the, the, it's not a matter of renegotiation. It is a matter of, of, of regularization, bringing it, salvaging it as much as possible to bring it within the confines the constraints of the laws of this country. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. I know that you have some more slides that you'd like to share with the participants. So let's take one more question and then we're gonna circle back to your slide presentation. So here is the question. Tiggy has mentioned it hasn't been able to get much off. And my question just disappeared from the screen. Uh, I believe that Mr. Uh, Alfred has answered the question and that just made us disappear from the screen. So this is it. Uh, Tiggy has mentioned hasn't been able to get much response from the government. Has Tiggy directly engaged the ESO, such as trying to reach out to Alistair Rutledge? If so, what was the response? I believe that um, uh, my colleague Alfred can give a better answer than I could. Alfred, could you respond yeah. to that, please? Yes, certainly. I am. Um, I was writing just now. Yes, with a lot of exclamation marks. We did um, Exxon EEPG so Exploration and Production and Limited um, had a, a, um, a, a Zoom presentation for stakeholders. I think it was in um, 
February, uh, sometime in February, I, I think it was. And it was a one-hour presentation, and TG was invited. I was happy to to attend, and apparently I was asking, I, I alone was asking the questions, you know, there were a, a couple others. But one of the questions I asked was for the information. He, he, he started, Mr. Routledge started the, the session by saying they would like to be transparent and accountable. And so, I mean, I took him up. I said, well, please could you give us this information? And I requested certain information. Well, he, uh, he eventually, they said, no, he, he, he put it on to the operations manager or the technical, I forgot what his um, designation was, but he's the, the technical guy. And, he, and the technical guy said that they do have to have these variables, these things to measure because they have to control the process. So I said, we should have this information. And Mr. Routledge said that we must ask the government because they are in contact with the government. No, I couldn't, I can't make an answer to that because Exxon has no contract with me, with the citizens. It has a contract with the government. And the citizens elect the government. <laughs> so we, go to, we went to the government. And of course, we related what happened, that uh, we asked the government, and the government has not answered, and the EIA has also not answered. That is the long and short of it. We hope that answers your question that the person asked. Is there another? Or yes. Follow? Well, uh, let's go back to the presentation I have. You have some more information to share with the group. And we have only about 15 minutes left from this, uh, this part of the conference. And I want to make sure that we can cover all the information that you like to share with the audience. So Mr. Collins, if you would, please go back to sharing your screen. OK. Uh, 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 let's see. As it turns out, there is nearly uh, there is merely one screen left to share, and uh, one slide left to share. And that is our, the launch of our open government call. And uh, we touched upon it, as it, it seems as though I've already given, given as much information as I, about it. TIGI is preparing to launch its call for open government. We intend to, evolve, to involve all religious bodies, ethnic organizations, political parties, civil society organizations, and everyone who has ears. This project should be up and running by July 1 latest. We trust that out of that process, our citizenry would begin to realize that they need to watch over their own affairs between elections, not just at election time, but between elections. And especially when an extractivist culture is what has begun to dominate the economy. And let us not fool ourselves that this is something new. We have had uh, uh, the kind of extractivist culture when the word did not exist. I remember as a young man listening to Mr. Forbes Burnham, who was the leader of the country, when he nationalized the Guyana the Demba, as it was called, the Royal Bauxite Company, his words were, what shall we tell the young people when they see the holes in the ground? And that was um, in the 1970s. And um, I don't know what he would have said when he saw the yawning holes left unfilled in the interior from gold mining. Um, I, the children he talked about grew up and those holes grew bigger. And of course, the ones that are going to be left in the seabed, we can't see, but the extractivist culture has had a long period of gestation. We are hoping that uh, we in Guyana have begun to do something about it. Because after all, if these companies thought that this was equatorial, 
uh, Guinea, where perhaps people don't have the freedom to be starred themselves without backlash, or if they feel that we didn't have the education to address it, I hope they're getting another impression. They might fool our leaders, but I don't think they can fool the intelligentsia of the country. The only thing that is standing between us is the intelligentsia thinking that they can't do much. And we have heard that kind of sentiment. They're closing their eyes to the, uh, the, the, the advent of a young lady named, I think her name is Greta Thunberg. And what happened in the last Exxon shareholders meeting when Exxon was expecting to have a different result. So all kinds of things can happen and all kinds of things can change. And I hope that our people will understand that we need to be star ourselves and address this issue and not think that anything is too big for us to deal with. So that's it for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we do have some questions here. So let's see. Uh, for its July 1st launch, is Tiggy going to use Facebook to reach out to Guyanese? Certainly. Facebook. And there's a little <laughs> suggestion here too. So Facebook personalities such as Guyanese Critic have over 100,000 Facebook subscribers. Engaging such personalities may get Tiggy message out broadly. Thank you for the suggestion. We know we plan to use social media and uh, we are grateful for that suggestion. Only today we were thinking about using, well, not only today, but uh, we were thinking about using some other um, uh, well-known personalities. But yes, that's a very good idea. Thank you for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, if Tingy is not able to engage Exxon, then how effective of the EITI process if the MSG parties don't respond to each other questions? Well, you know, we are not acting because we expect that Exxon will suddenly have an attack of, uh, what's, what, what word can I, can, can, can I, of, 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 of the urge to comply with, with, with Guyanese law. And so, as we have, as I have, uh, I believe, expressed that uh, we intend to do what we have to do, and Exxon will certainly do what we expect it to do. Thank you very much. Now, uh, this one is uh, uh, asking you to respond to the case that minister discretion allows for larger concessions. Sorry, I don't think I understand that question. Yeah, it is more, well, this is what it says. Please respond to the case that ministerial discretion allows for larger concessions. Ah, beautiful. That is the issue of ministerial discretion. And that, I am so glad that somebody raised that question because that was, we, we did a, a whole article about it and we, did not uh, base our conclusions upon our own analysis of the legal issues. We based our analysis upon the decisions of the court in several jurisdictions, especially the jurisdictions, the jurisdictions that we believe uh, English in Guyanese law uh, draws its inspiration from. And uh, we saw that whether it is Australia, wherever it is, we saw statements like uh, it is well established. Uh, uh, please forgive my, 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 my lack of legal um, um, term, but, but it's there in, in our, in our um, well, sorry? President. Well established precedent or words to that effect. Um, in, in, in the courts that no minister or no government official has uh, total elasticity in his, those are not the words they use, 
in any in any in any uh, decision which he has. He, he is always constrained. It's he's fettered. So the principle of un, un, unfettered discretion does not exist. They say the courts for the last hundred years have repeated themselves. And so when the uh, uh, the, the the law said that the minister may grant more if um, the minister felt it necessary. The minister could not simply feel that he should grant a thousand times and, uh, and, and grant it without a basis because he had to do so within the context of why the law provided him with that leeway. And if you check and see all the other countries, which clearly Guyana law was based on, there was a specific reason why the minister was given that latitude. And that reason was that when it was time to um, for relinquishment, you might have contiguous license uh, 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 blocks. And so what is left in one might need to be combined with what is left in another. So if the maximum is 5,073 and you have a piece sticking out just nearby, the minister must have the, 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 the latitude to add that on to the 5,073 and make it one package. Not the nonsense that was done. So that the, 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 the reason for the officials stretching of his discretion must be based in the reason that he was granted it in itself. And so we did not do our own analysis as much as rely on the analysis and the judgments of courts in different jurisdictions to come to that conclusion. Thank you so much for explaining that so clearly to us. Very much appreciated. Now, here is the next question. What would be Tiggy's justification for leaving the oil under the seabed? And when will you make a clear and transparent policy position on this? And I guess that the, the that, that is a follow up to our saying that we had not yet come to the conclusion. And so um, when it is necessary for us to explain that our position has been based on the fact that we had not come to any conclusion while we were looking at the risk analysis, how much money were we going to get as a country? We know it was going to corrupt a few people. It was going to put the prices of land and the cost of living up, et cetera, et cetera, the dust disease, blah, blah, blah. But if the risks were, if, if, if the risks were worth the benefits or the benefits were worth the risks, I don't know, maybe my nose is, but you know what I mean. If the difference was positive, that we had more benefit than risk, we were going to support the project. And uh, we are still of that opinion. However, when we see what we are seeing, we have to pay attention to the case and why our colleagues in the environmental cases that are being brought to the complaints, uh, we have to pay attention. And so we can see a time coming if that continues without arrest, because we believe there is still the opportunity to bring things under some degree of sanity and control. If we didn't do that, if we didn't believe so, we shouldn't be launching that project. And so uh, we have not yet come to the conclusion uh, as our, uh, per perhaps we don't know as much as you, as you saw when you asked the question of, uh, to do the comparison of, of what that uh, uh, amount of carbon meant. We are not experts in that field. We, don't, we, are, we, we are not stuck with experts. We are simple guys trying to respond to the need for our, our country to wake up. And so um, we don't know as yet. That's the answer. And we have not come to that conclusion, but we can very well come to that conclusion. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins. And we have time for one last question. And here it goes. What is TG's strategic plan for the next five years? And if the document is publicly available? Oh, that is, that is such an interesting question. And uh, let me answer the question that way. Uh, this way, the, the, the document is being set forth. It will be made uh, 
public, but at this point, it is not being finalized. But what we can see is that our strategic plan is based on Transparency International 2030 strategy. And uh, in that strategic plan, uh, the new, the new uh, policy of TI is that each of its chapters or chapters to be will select out from the menu of the, the totality of the, the strategy and uh, uh, work program to build the local chapters strategy and work program. Ours is uh, going to be set, set out, but I can tell you that a lot of it can be gleaned from what was said today, what are our approaches and what are our emphases over the next month or so. Thank you so much, Mr. Collins, and thank you so much for Mr. Alfred Bulai to jo for joining us today and creating such an invigorating conversation about the topic of transparency in the extractive sector. And in closing, I would like to point out that we do have a survey, a transparency survey, and I have put it in the chat multiple times throughout this uh, this section here. So go ahead and click on it and see that this transparency survey is available to all of our conference participants and it is aimed to capture your perceptions. And once you take the survey, you can also view the results live. And this is accumulation of the results over time. So as people take the survey, more and more of the results are showing. So you will see how these bars would move as people answer this question. So right after a few uh, demographic questions, we really dive into the deep end and ask questions like, do you feel that the oil and gas industry has a positive impact on Guyana? Or questions like, do you feel that your country has been impacted positively by the extractive industry? So we have some real, real great questions here and we are very much open to your perception. So please go ahead and complete the survey and add your voice to this experiment. We would love to hear from many, many, many of you. And in closing, let me just say that thank you so much for our present panelists today. We are really, really happy to have both president and the vice president here today. And thank you for Mr. Collins and thank you for Mr. Bulai. And I have to say that you took the most question out of all of the presenters. They have been part of our conference. So it has really generated a lively debate. And that's exactly the reason why we put this conference on so people can share their perspective. They can talk about these topics. They can exchange ideas, point out the facts, the source of information. And it's been a pleasure to have both of you provide just that for the audience. So with that, well, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Giddy. And um, I, as you know, when when um, you when we received this invitation from you, we had some concerns as to whether our um, our the positions that we had taken were going to make us persona non grata at your conference. So I'm happy to know that we still seem to be on speaking terms. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. We love to have both of you and we love to see this debate. This is exactly the reason why we have this conference. So I encourage you to tune into the other parts of the conference. And for our participants, I'd like to point out that we have some special workshops and exchanges scheduled for tomorrow and Thursday. For Wednesday morning, the MSG members are going to have an exchange. It is a closed session, so the MSG members have been invited. In the afternoon, we provide information and training for journalists and journalist students. So if you fall into that category, please do reach out to us because we have a session for you ready to go and uh, you are welcome to join. And then on Thursday morning, we have a dedicated workshop and exchange of ideas and experiences for civil society organizations. So if you fall into that category, please do reach out to us organizers because we have a special workshop. It's an exchange that we have set up.
And then the afternoon, Thursday, we go back to the journalist and we have a webinar and then we have a private discussion just for Guy and his journalist. And then in the afternoon, we have a documentary screening and discussion with the directors. So it's going to be very, very great content for these coming two days. And then on Friday, we are back with open panels, which is open to all audience. So your link that you have used today to join any of the conversations, that's the same link that you can use on Friday to tune into that conversation. And we are going to close our conference on Friday, but I hope that I get to see many of you throughout the coming three days. And thank, thank you, so you so much, much and have a great evening. Same to everyone. Thank you again. Bye.